Take courage, son. Your sins are forgiven you. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Lord forgives the sins of the paralytic. And then we see him, he understands and knows the thoughts within the hearts of the scribes that are there. He realizes that they are unbelieving of this. And because of that, because they're accusing him of blasphemy, he then heals the man of his bodily injuries. He heals him from uh, his, his, uh, his paralyzed state in order to prove that he indeed was able to forgive their sins when he said so. Prove that he is indeed God. The scribes thought that he blasphemed because of a partial truth in that sense. They thought that he blasphemed because they doubted his divinity, which, of course, that is the not true part of that. But they doubt, they said that he blasphemed because he said he forgives sins, and they knew that the, the truth was that God is the only one that can forgive sins. Now, Christ being God, he had every right to forgive the man's sins. And um, they claim, the claim that, uh, that they make that is that God only can forgive truth is something that may come down to us and puzzle us a bit now. Okay, if God is the only one that can forgive sins, why then? Do we have the sacrament of penance? Why then do we have to go to a priest to have our sins forgiven if it is God alone who has that power? Well, this is where our sermon takes us today is, is into this very most important sacrament and where it comes from. God does forgive sins and it's a power rele relegated to him and him alone. But as in any authority, he has the ability to delegate that to those chosen by him. Think of a king or a ruler of a country who, any ruler of a country, who has the ability to negotiate with other neighboring countries, say for trade. You know, and it's within that ruler's power to come up with a good agreement for the two parties. But he doesn't have the time to always go himself. So what does he do? He gives that power to one appointed by him and sends him off to go negotiate that trade deal with that other country. Well, it's the same for God. He realizes that in order to have, you know, he it was not his will to be here, you know, till the end of time physically. He was to die for our sins and he was to rise and ascend into heaven. And there would be so many people in the world that not everybody could come to see him in Jerusalem and be able to go confess their sins to him. So what does he do? He appoints priests to hear confessions. He gives them a delegated power from himself to forgive <laughs> sins. And he, when he tells them, what's, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. That actual power of forgiving sins is possessed by the priest, but it's only because God has given it to him in a way of sort of delegation. The sacrament of penance, really, when we think of it, is one of the greatest mercies that God has given to us all. Why is that? Why is it such a great mercy? Well, when we fall into sin, we've given up what we've already taken back in the great verse. You know, man fell, Adam and Eve fell in the garden of, of Eden, and they lost that gift of sanctifying grace. Christ came and, and died for our sins, redeemed mankind, and he gives us grace back by the sacrament of baptism. <clears throat> and then when we commit mortal sin, we then turn and throw it away again. We don't deserve to regain it a third time, or a fourth time, or a fifth time, or however many times it may be. We don't deserve that by anything in ourselves. But God wants us to have that. He, because he loves us, is willing to forgive us our sins. And he gives us that great sacrament in order that we can 
be forgiven, that we can obtain sanctifying grace again, that we can receive his mercy towards our souls. But just as if we would, if we offended somebody in this life, we would then go and ask for forgiveness. We too have to now come to God and ask for his forgiveness for our sins to obtain it. And the means that he has set up for that is by the sacrament of penance. He has given us a person who stands in his place, the priest, to forgive sins. And this is why we come and confess them in an audible way. Also, the reason why we have to, you know, when, when you, if you ever hear, you know, Protestants attacking that, that idea of confessing sins to a priest, it's right in their own scriptures, the need for it. Right there in that quote that I said, you know, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. He gives that power to the apostles, which is then passed on to their successors in the priesthood. And it's only possible for them to make that judgment of whether to forgive or to retain sin, if they actually can hear it, if they actually can know what those sins are. And so that's always important from an apologetics point of view, to hold in your mind when someone says, why do you have to go confess your sins to a man? Well, because our Lord gave that to us. Also, it's important for us to remind ourselves, remember for ourselves, that confession really is the only way of removing mortal sin from our souls, to restoring sanctifying grace once it is lost. It's just as if you have some sort of severe bodily injury. It's only going to heal itself if you give it proper medical treatment. Well, the same thing. We have wounded, we have created a fatal blow to our souls. And the only way we can repair that is by a spiritual healing done through that sacrament of penance. And in the case of necessity, if we were dying or something, of course, there is the possibility of, of uh, an action of perfect contrition, which sins can be forgiven. But it's only in those cases of necessity that this ever is effectual, that our sins are actually forgiven. So if we are going to die before we we make it to a, a priest, then, yes, our sins can be taken away by that perfect act of contrition. But it's not something we can ever presume that we have done well. We should always try to make them if we do fall into sin, just in case. But it's not something we can never presume to have done well. And should we live long enough to see a priest, it is something that we still need to confess because the only way of forgiving them in this life is by that action of confession. So, knowing that we have to go to confession, knowing that this is how our sins are forgiven, how do we do so well? First off, it starts with a good examination of conscience. This is something that too many times people gloss over too quickly. Either that, depending on, on the type of person, if they are a person of lack of conscience or even just a, in a rush or something like that, they'll gloss over it too quickly. They'll make a real quick examination and they'll, and they'll go, okay, well, I think I got most of it and I'll, I'll just run in there and make a confession. Or if someone is too scrupulous, then they'll spend too much time examining and trying to think of almost creating sins where they didn't exist or creating even a greater level of sin to them where it was something less uh, less harsh. So we have to find that balance. We have to spend a amount of time to be able to find our sins for what they are, and then we go into the confessional. That's our examination of conscience. It's also important to make an examination of conscience because it's it's a sacrament. It's something that's holy in itself. And it's not right for us to go from the street and run into the box, to go from thinking worldly thoughts and then switch the switch and then go right in to make confession. No, we have to, just like we would for communion, 
We have to do the same for confession. We have to prepare ourselves, get ourselves in a, in a spiritual mind frame to be able to do so as well as possible, to gain as many actual graces from that as, as we can. Secondly, to make a good confession, it's necessary that when it comes to mortal sin, <laughs> that we give a number and a type of every mortal sin committed. That if a sin is, is mortal, then we have to know how many times we've done that to the best of our ability to, to put a number to that. And we have to give enough information about what the sin is that that priest knows what sin was committed. We don't need to go into such great detail to paint a vivid picture, but he has to know the species of sin, the type of sin that was actually committed. And so he can make a proper judgment on that. And it's also important to mention with that, that we are never to intentionally leave out a mortal sin from a confession. To do so means that we won't be forgiven for our sins confessed in that confession. To do so means that not only do we lack the forgiveness of God, even though the, the priest may give absolution, but also we've added an additional sin on that. We've added the sin of sacrilege, the abuse of a good confession. Now that does not include something that we may have truly forgotten. You know, it's not, you know, we're not expected to be a perfect memory all the time. And so we trust in God's mercy if we do truly forget something that, and we know that our sins are forgiven, and then we can bring that up in our next confession. But it is, if we deliberately leave something out, that is when we have really done something very wrong. And with that, no knowledge of we have to confess our sins, we should never fear to confess our mortal sins. Because the priest is there for one purpose and one purpose only. He is there to give absolution. He is there to forgive your sins. And provided that you want your sins forgiven, and provided that you're sorry for them, that is what you're going to receive. You're going to receive exactly what the sacrament is set out for. You're going to receive mercy in that regard. Don't worry about, oh, Father is going to think less of me. He can never talk about those things that come up in your confession again. He can never act upon them again. He knows it only through that confession, and it's only in the seal of confession, those times when you were there to confess, that he can he can bring that back up again. He might, in the future confessions that he gets to know the person, he might re relate to past confessions in a way of being able to, if he sees a pattern, to, to work with you, to help you grow, but never in a way of, of, of bringing something up in a way to shame you, and a never, ever outside of that realm of confession ever again. And, moreover, it's always important to realize that you should never be so ashamed of your sins that you don't want to confess it to a priest. First off, there's nothing we haven't heard. So nothing, you know, you're not so creative that you're going to think of something to do really bad that we haven't heard already. And secondly, is that God already knows them. And ultimately, while it might be myself, or Father McGuire, Father Lesranta, whomever in the box actually hearing the confession, the one you are confessing to is God himself. And he already knows. And so there's no sense in hiding it any longer. Just come and ask for forgiveness for what he already knows you want to be forgiven for. When it comes to venial sins in the confessional, it's not necessary to, nece to list an exact number or even a number really at all because venial sins can be taken away by, uh, by proper use of sacramentals or after confessions made outside of confession and things like that. Uh, but it is important to confess them when you think of them because it helps in the way of growth. It helps in looking for the root cause to those those venial offenses. It helps us to, to, to be humble and it helps us to, to gain sacramental graces for them. 
our confessions should always be ended with expression for sorrow of past sins. Every confession should really, when you've done listing your last sin that you've committed in this confession, you should say, for, for these and all my past sins, or for these and all my past sins, especially this type of sin. You're not reconfessing the sin. But what you are doing is showing that you are sorry for your sins and you are sorry for any sins you ever committed in your life. And in that way, you're constantly having that little conversion of your heart that you're turning away from the old man to embrace the new man, the new man of God. Fourth, we hear from the priest in that confession things that are necessary for us to take into our, for ourselves. We're going to get a little bit of advice, a little snippet of, of spiritual advice. It may be something more generic or it may be something more specific, but it's something that we can always learn and take to grow from. We're going to maybe get asked a couple of questions if we haven't been clear enough, because the priest will ask and has to ask if he's not quite sure exactly the type or the species or the, or the number of a sin. Um, and then... Once that is done, you'll make an act of contrition in this way, showing that you are truly sorry for your sins by your expression of your mouth and showing that you have an amendment to change in the future. We'll get to those two points, contrition and amendment, in a moment. And then you have the penance. The penance that is received from the priest has to be done. It's always important to remember that you are bound to do the penance given to you by the priest if you want your sins forgiven. Now, that's not to say that your sins aren't forgiven if you are unable to perform the penance before communion comes up. No, you can go to communion with full confidence as long as you still have that intention of doing the penance when you get that opportunity to. But most times your penance is going to be some sort of list of prayers, and something that hopefully you'll be able to do when you get back to your pew. And it's best, because of knowing our own weakness of memory, it's best to do them right away, unless we forget about it later on, unintentionally. And penance is something that's necessary all the way, because, it is, because we have, when we sin, we do so not just with our souls, and our wills, but we do so most likely usually with our bodies combined with it. And in a way, we have to combine the two to make amends for the things done. We can even see that in today's gospel. We see that the paralytic is not just have his sins forgiven, but once Christ heals from, from his paralyzed state, what does he tell him to do? He gives him a small little penance. He makes him carry his own pallets and to go away. He makes him pick it up and carry it with him. That's his little penance to the paralytic after forgiving his sins. Two things that are necessary for us in order to be forgiven. Contrition and amendment. Contrition is a sorrow for sin. Contrition is being sorry that we've actually committed what we've done. And it takes two forms. It takes... Two forms with varying degrees where we can really kind of combine the two of them at times in our lives. There is a perfect contrition. Perfect contrition, we hinted at at the beginning, making a perfect act of contrition. What does that mean? Well, perfect contrition for sin is when we are sorry of our sins purely for the reason that it has offended God. We're sorry for them because we love God and we hate the idea that we may have ever offended Him by our actions. Imperfect uh, contrition is our second type of contrition. And imperfect contrition is that we're sorry because we're, fear we're fearful of the punishment that we might receive. In this case, we're fearful of losing our souls. We're fearful of our own judgment. That's an imperfect contrition. Now, imperfect is not to be confused with no contrition because imperfect contrition for confession is sufficient. God accepts that. God is pleased by that. He'd be more pleased that we continue to work to try to gain a perfect contrition, but 
he knows that we might not be at that point in our lives at this moment, and so he takes that imperfect contrition gratefully and accepts it. And so either one of these, or a combination of the two, is all that we need. We just have to know that what we have done is wrong and that we're sorry to God that we've done it. We don't have to have a movement of feelings. We just have to know that I need to be sorry for this and I am sorry that I have done it. Amendment is the resolve that we have to have not to commit sin again. A lack of amendment is usually the indicator for a lack of contrition. Because if someone is sorry, they'll at least want to not fall into that sin again. And by that is what we mean by amendment. We, we have to at least be willing to try to fight against sin in the future. It's not to say we're going to be perfect. It's not to say that we're going to always be able to fight off every temptation or we're never going to commit the same sin again. That's not what we mean by, by amendment of life. What we mean is that we have to at least put forth some effort or have an intention of putting forth an effort. Even if the next temptation down the pike trips us up all over again, we still have to be able to have at least the willingness to want to try to change when we are there making our, act of, our, our, our confession. It's a basic, simple amendment. And generally speaking, most people have that, even when they have a, a habitual sin that they are really struggling against and seem to be continually falling into. That doesn't mean they don't have amendment of their life. It just means that their amendment is not strong enough yet to carry them through successfully through those trials. But they're still uh, sufficiently uh, amending their life for the forgiveness of their sins. It's only when they have no intention of even trying to fight against temptation in the future that they lack amendment. What are the effects of confession on the soul? Number one... Sin is taken away. That's the most obvious of, of the effects on the soul. We have sin on our souls, and it is taken away from our souls by our good confessions. Number two, if we have fallen into mortal sin, sanctifying grace is returned to us. The Holy Ghost brings it back to us, and we are able to act in a grace-filled way again. We are act, able to act in accordance with all the virtues, all over again, in a supernatural way. The love of God is returned to us by a good confession. Sacramental graces are also received. And it's this point that is also important to focus on because it's often forgotten. But we know that it, our sins are taken away. We know that sanctifying grace is returned to us, but we forget about the actual graces, the sacramental graces that come to us by this great sacrament, because these are what are going to help us to avoid sins in the future. It's these things that are going to strengthen our soul, because we have humbled ourselves, because we have confessed them, because we have re- uh, built up that strength of grace in our souls that will be more successful in the future if we are frequent in visiting the sacrament of penance. This is why it is most important for a person who is fighting habitual sin to come regularly to confession, to come and confess their sins, even if they feel like they're saying the same thing one week after another. That's okay, because you're going to continue to humble yourself, you're going to learn from that, and you're going to hopefully be able to build up graces to fight against it in the future. It's also why everybody should frequent this confession, uh, this great sacrament, because none of us should pretend that we are strong enough to fight temptation on our own. We need supernatural grace to act in a supernatural way. We need strength to be able to fight against things that tempt us. Christ knows our sins, and he desires to forgive each and every one of us. He desires to do this so that we can move forward in his grace. A priest desires the same exact thing. He, representing Christ, sits 
in the confessional like Christ, waiting for each penitent with the same mindset of our Lord. He hopes to forgive sins. He has that same mindset of the father of the prodigal son, who is not as concerned about the sins committed in the past, but only is looking for that sorrow so he can forgive them and move forward and rejoice at the fact that somebody has confessed their sins and has had them forgiven. That is what the priest's purpose in there is, and that is his mindset. Nothing makes him more happy than to see a sinner who has fallen away come back to the grace and the sacraments through a good confession. The forgiveness of God awaits each and every person. So come as often as you can. If it has been a long time for you in coming, don't put it off any longer. It's been long enough. Those graces are sitting there for you. That forgiveness is waiting there for you. And come to this sacrament with contrition. And come to that sacrament with confidence in its efficacious graces. This is the great sacrament of penance that everybody should be receiving on a regular basis. And if you do this, and all grace will be restored to you. And it's through that that you will be able to continue to make spiritual progress in your own lives and eventually sanctify yourselves for eternity. May God bless you in the name of the Father and the